Judy and I are so thankful to be back with you here in Columbia. We've been looking forward to this so very, very much. I think it was about three years ago or something like that that uh, Shahe was here. Maybe it's been longer than that. And he said, I want to get you and Billy to come and hold our tent meeting. You usually have an outreach meeting, a tent meeting. I think I held one. I think it seems like I held two of those meetings uh, in the past. And uh, they were good meetings, and I really enjoyed them. Had a lot of drop-in people who would just drop in. We baptized a woman. You remember, uh, kind of lost track of her. And then one time there was a young man who showed up and he was walking around at the back. I was kind of watching him. He would sit down and get up and sit down. And he had a, a red A on his shirt. And come to find out afterwards, he was the president of the Atheist Association over at the University of Missouri. Remember that? And he came several nights. He came to debate. And we would talk with him, but I don't know what's happened to him. And so you never know what's going to happen at any meeting, but certainly a tent meeting. So I was looking forward to that. But, uh, of course, things didn't work out where we could do that. But still, we're glad to be here and uh, looking forward to this uh, meeting. Glad Judy is able to be with me. Billy called me early this morning and uh, said that he's coming up tomorrow. He, was, he had a meeting in Kentucky, and so he'd been gone for two consecutive Sundays and and so he begged off for this Sunday. I told him I'd come up and start the meeting. But his plan is to be here tomorrow night, Lord willing, and be with us through the rest of the meeting. He and I have held a couple of these meetings before, two or three meetings like this before, two of them down at Hoyt, and it seemed like another one somewhere else where we preached together. And so instead of both of us preaching the same night and kind of stepping on each other and getting in each other's way, we decided to preach a night about. So I'm going to preach both times today, of course, and then he'll preach tomorrow night, and then I'll preach Tuesday night, and so forth. So hopefully that will be uh, a good way to do it, and I think it will, and we're looking forward to working together, and hopefully God will bless us. Maybe we'll have some folks come out to the meeting, and we're looking forward to having a really good meeting. Judy and I are a little tired this morning. Leah and Terry, my daughter and son-in-law, who live down in... Little Rock, just outside of Little Rock, had their 20th anniversary Tuesday. So they decided to take a, a trip, an anniversary trip. So they asked us if we would come and stay with our grandkids, Sam and Emma. So we went over Monday. We've been there in Little Rock since Monday. And we left yesterday afternoon about 2 and got in at 1030. And uh, I, I was telling Bill and Karen, I'm at the point anymore where three hours is about enough for me. Used to, I could drive all night, and I still can if I have to, but three hours and I'm about done. So it was about eight hours up here, and so I'm done. <laughs> That's all I want to drive for a while. But we have both slept good last night. We're still a little weary and blurry, but hopefully we'll get better. And so anyway, having said all that, it's good to be here. One more thing I need to say, of course, is when Austin was texting us, and I'm glad Austin is here working with the church. I remember meeting Austin in Bedford, I believe it was, several years ago, and he was just a young man, and he spoke, I think, I held the Labor Day meeting there one year, and he spoke, and I was impressed with him then as a young man, and I knew he wanted to be a preacher, and I'm so glad that he's here with you, and, and I'm glad we'll be able to have a little time this week. But anyway, when he texted about the meeting, he said, do you have a theme for the meeting? And so I talked to Billy, and we really didn't have a theme. Billy said, I'm going to preach whatever I want to, and I said, well, I am too. <laughs> But I said it'd be nice to have a little theme. So I have a chart. And I don't think you've seen this one. This was a chart. You've seen some of my charts that were made by a brother Winchester. Uh, his son gave them to me several years ago. But brother James Winchester uh, preached back in the 60s and 70s in California. And he made these beautiful charts. And I don't think you've seen this one. And so he, he gave me this one. And... When I got it, I thought, what a beautiful chart. There's a light in God's window. But I asked uh, James Jr., his son, I said, I want to use this, but what was the sermon about? There's no scriptures on it. It's got these words on it. I thought, was there a, somebody lost in the woods? And he saw a, a light in the window. Was that the story? I couldn't think of any biblical reference to a light in a window as such. He said, I don't remember. So I thought, well, I'll have to come up with something. 
So finally, I came up with a sermon that I'm going to give today. I guess we might call this the keynote sermon about Daniel. Daniel was a light in God's window to the Persians, and he's still a light today. So I told Billy, we'll, I'll put this up, and we can preach any sermon and uh, reference this. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus also said, you're the light of the world. So we're God's lights, as it were, in the window to the world. So anyway, I'm going to leave that up, and that will be the theme of our meeting for what it's worth. This morning, I want to talk to you about Daniel. I have a long title on the board. I don't know if you can see this title. I was telling Austin I held a meeting last month down in Pleasant Hill, which is a little church outside of Kansas City, and there was a sister there who after the meeting said, that title was the best thing in the whole meeting. And so I thought, well, it is a neat title, I think. I'm going to talk about an old man, an angel, a bunch of lions, and an all-night prayer meeting. And this is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Let me read as an introduction, starting with verse 19. Now, I'm going to really fo focus on Daniel 6 and verse 10, one of the greatest passages in all the Word of God, I believe. But let me read uh, what happens after Daniel was dropped down in the den of lions. And then we'll talk about this, of course. In verse 19 of Daniel chapter 6, the Bible says, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. When he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, as your God whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, notice one angel, and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I've done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. What a great story. What a great incident. We're going to focus on that this morning. Before we go to God in prayer, we want to remember Daniel and his great prayer. And God answered his prayer, and God will answer our prayers as well, we believe. So let's humble ourselves at this time as we pray. Daniel was a godly man and thankful through his days. He never failed to pray to God and give him all the praise. His trials were so many and he was tempted sore, but he was saved by righteousness and the godly cloak he wore, interpreting the royal dreams through wisdom from on high. He ever gave the praise to God as his life did verify. In the fiery furnace and in the lion's den, the flames were stayed, the jaws were set, before oppressing men. But he emerged triumphant, for God was ever near. He guards his children from all harm when danger does appear. Through our temptations and our trials on life's tempestuous ways, I thank thee, God, for Daniel and for his life of praise. Upon my knees, I pray that God will make me thankful too and worthy of his love and care, and I know he'll see me through. I don't know about you, but I pray that I can be like Daniel. Daniel was a light in his world. He was a light to the Persian Empire and to the Persian monarch Darius. And he's still a light today. And I pray that I can be a light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light. But he also said, you are the light of the world. And of course, we have no light intrinsic in ourselves. The only light we have comes from Jesus. We reflect his light, or maybe another way to say it is, His light is in us and shines in us and through us. And so we want to be a light to the world as Daniel was. Now we know that Daniel, along with his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were about 15 years old when they were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar and carried off into Babylon. And Daniel, along with his friends, has been in Daniel for, uh, been in Babylon for 70 years because of his excellent spirit, because God was with him and his friends. They were promoted, and they were 
people who served Nebuchadnezzar, they were governors in the Babylonian Empire for 70 long years. And so Daniel now is about 85 years old, if not older. And by the way, the Babylonian Empire has fallen. The Persians have conquered the Babylonians. And now there's a new king. His name is Darius. And he is the monarch over the vast Persian Empire. And so Darius is setting up his government. And he looks around and he picks out 125 governors to govern over all of the various territories. And then he decides over these 120 20, uh, governors to pick three administrators, or the King James Version calls them presidents. Three men he picks to rule over all of his empire. And one of the men he picks is Daniel. Now that's interesting. Daniel is an old man. He's 85 years old, maybe older than that. But the Bible said he had an excellent spirit. Obviously, he had an impeccable reputation, as we'll see. And he had a great spirit. And obviously, Darius said, heard about him and knew about him. And he chose Daniel to be one of the three presidents or administrators. But watch this. After the government is set up, a little time passes. Darius begins to watch these three presidents and he decides Daniel's the best. Daniel is the most honest. He's the hardest working one. He has this excellent spirit. And he decides he's going to make Daniel number one. He's going to promote Daniel over the other two administrators and over the whole empire. Now this doesn't sit well with the other two presidents, nor the governors. I guess they think that old Jew... He's going to promote that old man over all of us. They decide that they're going to do something about it. So they decide to have an investigation. Now we're used to investigations. There's all kinds of committees investigating all kinds of things in our country today, endlessly, it seems like. And so they decided to set up a committee, I guess, and investigate Daniel, and they did. And you know what? Now Daniel's been in government for 70 years. He's been in government 70 years. Surely there would be some malfeasance. Surely they could find something, but they couldn't find anything. They went through his work record, nothing. Nothing amiss. They looked in his personal life, nothing. Isn't that amazing? I've often wondered what would happen if uh, where I work or where you work, the other people decided to embarrass you, and they decided to investigate your work and your life. Couldn't they find some skeleton in the closet? Something? They couldn't find anything. Well, finally they get together and they think, what are we going to do? Well, finally somebody spoke up and said, there's only one thing to do. If we're going to get him, it's going to be his religion. This man puts his God and his religion over the king. And so if we can create a discrepancy between his loyalty to the king and his God will get him. And so they came up with a plan. I'm going to tell you it was a pretty good plan. The Bible says they wrote out a decree. And I like the way the Bible puts this in the New King James translation. The Bible says they thronged the king. The way I see this is Darius was sitting in his throne room, maybe all by himself, and they all come in. A hundred and, now there's 120 of these governors plus the two administrators. So the way I read this, all 122 of them, can you imagine, come rushing through the door, and they're all a flutter, and they say, oh king, oh king. And he's thinking, what's going on? They say, well, we have written out a decree. We all got together. Now these are all of his administrators. We all got together, and we came up with this decree that we want you to sign. And here's what it says. For 30 days, for a month, Nobody can pray to any God or man. Notice that. Not only can they not petition their God, and of course these people had all kinds of gods, but they can't even petition, petition any man except you. Now if anybody needs anything, they can't go to their God, they can't go to some, they've got to come to you. Well, I guess Darius got the big head. He got to thinking that's pretty good. That kind of makes me a God. But they said also down here in the fine print, it said... If anybody does pray to any god or anybody except you, he's to be thrown to the lions. Now I will tell you something about 
Darius. He was like all of these monarchs back in that time. They were tyrants. Human life meant nothing to them. And Darius kept hungry lions down in a den. And if you got on his bad side, he'd just throw you and feed you to the lions. Human life meant nothing at all. Now, he didn't know they had Daniel in mind. He loved Daniel. If he had known for a moment that this was to get Daniel, he wouldn't have signed it, but the Bible said he signed the decree. Now we come to Daniel 6, verse 10. I've already said, I think this is one of the greatest passages in all the book of Daniel and really in all the Word of God. The Bible says when Daniel knew the decree was signed. Notice this. Daniel knew what the law was. He knew the penalty. He knew exactly what was at stake. When Daniel knew that the king had signed this law, he went home. He went upstairs. I guess he had a two or three story house or apartment. And he went upstairs and he got down on his knees with his face toward Jerusalem and he prayed to God three times that day just like he had done from the days of his youth, the Bible says. Now I want to dissect this passage a little bit. What a great passage this is. There's a lot here to unpack. First of all, the Bible says that Daniel got down on his knees. Now, he's an old man. You know, I remember when I was a boy, some of us who are older remember this. When I was a boy, whenever the prayer was led, like uh, Brother Austin led the prayer a minute ago, all the men got on their knees. And a lot of the women... You remember that? We don't do that anymore. I, I guess we've kind of outgrown that. Now, I'm not saying we have to do that. There is no posture which is mandated in the Bible. In the Bible, we can read about people standing and praying, sitting and praying, laying flat on the ground. So the posture is not uh, mandatory. But you know what, brethren? There's something about getting on your knees. And I'm not saying you have to get on your knees in church, but maybe tonight... Before you go to bed, when you say your prayers, get on your knees. There's something about getting down on your knees before God. And old Daniel, as old as he was, and I'm sure his knees weren't in that great a shape, he got on his knees three times every day to pray to God. That really is remarkable to me. Did you notice it says he did it three times that day? You remember David said to the, in the Psalms, he said, I will lift up my heart to you in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. Now again, the Bible doesn't mandate that we have to pray three times a day or four times a day. We can pray as many times as we need to pray. But you know, it's, uh, there's something about a habit. Sometimes people say, I know I need to read the Bible more. I just don't have time. Well, make it a habit. Every morning before you go to work, read a chapter. Maybe at lunchtime when you have a little 10 or 15 minute break, read the Bible. At night before you go to bed, read a chapter. And if you do that, Habitually, it uh, becomes such a wonderful habit that it blesses you. And so the Bible says that Daniel prayed to God three times on his knees every day. Did you notice it says he prayed toward Jerusalem? Now, why did he do that? Well, I'll tell you what. We've been going through the book of 1 Kings at home, and uh, Solomon's just built the temple, and he prays a great prayer of dedication. And in that prayer, he says, Lord, may people... May all of your people always turn their eyes toward Jerusalem. Now there's nothing magical, nothing special about Jerusalem even back then, except that's where the temple was, and that's where God's name was honored. And so you know what? Daniel is praying toward Jerusalem, not superstitiously, but you know what he's remembering? He's remembering home. That's where he'd been raised up till he was about 15 years old. That's where his mother and father are buried. That's where the temple stood before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it. That's where he learned about God. And so every day he turns his face toward home. And I want to say something right here to the boys and girls in this building. You young people especially. Don't forget home. Now one of these days you're going to grow up and leave home. Maybe go off to college or move away to another city. Don't you forget what you learned at home. Don't you forget what your mom and dad taught you. Don't you forget what you learned in your home congregation right here. Don't ever forget home. And Daniel never did. He's an old man, 85 or 90 years old, but he's still thinking about home. And so he prays with his face toward Jerusalem. And then did you notice the Bible says that his windows were open. His windows were opened. 
Now, you know, I used to think this was uh, theoretical, but I'm not so sure anymore. I used to say if our government were to pass a law that we couldn't pray for 30 days or we couldn't go to church for 30 days, it's not so theoretical anymore, is it? I used to think, you know, I'll keep praying. I'll pray. But now, I'm not so sure I'm going to leave my windows open. I mean, there's no need to look, just put your head on the chopping block. Why in the world would Daniel leave his windows open? Well, you know what I'm convinced of? Daniel wanted them to see. I think the old man thought, I'm going to pray to God, and if they want to see, I want them to see. And so he leaves his windows open. Well, listen, I was reading this uh, this morning. I read over this chapter this morning again. Isn't it interesting how you... Read a chapter and you see something you didn't see before. And I noticed it says that they all assembled down there. I used to think maybe it was a, they had a couple of lookouts. But the Bible seems to indicate that all 122 of them, can you imagine? Shh, be quiet. 122 of them, they're all down there and they're watching up there. And sure enough, they see the old man get down on his knees. Well, the Bible says they go back and throng the king. Again, he's sitting in his chamber, and here they come in. And I guess he thinks, what's wrong this time? Now watch these guys. Watch how pernicious and subtle they are. They come in and they say, uh, King Darius, didn't you write a decree the other day? Didn't you write it? Well, they knew he did. They, they wrote it. Didn't you sign a decree the other day that says nobody could pray to any god for 30 days except you? He said, well, of course. They said, Daniel. That man you love so much, the man that you're going to make head over the empire, he has been praying to his God. Now get him and throw him in the lion's den. All oh, the Bible says the king's upset with himself. He's upset with them, as we'll see momentarily, but he's upset with himself that he was uh, tricked this way. And the Bible said he worked and worked till the sun went down. I guess he called in his lawyers and said, can't we get out of this? There was no way to get out of it. And finally, they insisted. They said, look, the law is the law, and you've got to throw him to the lions. Well, he doesn't want to, but he, Daniel is brought, and he's taken down to the den of lions. You know, I used to think when I would picture this in my mind that uh, there was a, a den, a cave, and there was a stairway. And I used to think Daniel uh, walked down the stairs, but of course... He couldn't have done that because the lions would have come up if there were stairs. And so it was a pit. And the only way to get down that pit was to be either thrown in or maybe they'd put a rope around you and drop you down. And so poor old Daniel, either they throw him in. I hope they didn't. Maybe they put a rope around him and they lower him down. And I'll guarantee you those lions are growling. They're hungry. They're kept hungry. They're salivating. They're waiting for their food. But here's the amazing thing. As poor old Daniel is going down to the pit, the king, now this is Darius, the old heathen king, he says to Daniel, Daniel, don't you worry. Your God that you serve continually, he'll deliver you. You talk about a light. Daniel had obviously been an influence on that king. And that king said, Daniel, your God will save you. I believe that he will. Well, he was dropped down. They had some kind of a slab that was placed over the top of the pit. And the Bible said the king went to his house and the king didn't sleep that night. No musical instruments were brought to soothe him. He walked back and forth all night long. Finally, the next morning, he went down and said, roll the slab away. And I guess it was dark down there. He couldn't see Daniel. He hollered down. I read what it says. In fact, the Bible said he said in a lamentable voice, Oh, Daniel, he says, did your God sir, save you from the lions? And Daniel said, Oh, king, live forever. That's what you said to those kings back then. Oh, king, live forever. Last night, God sent an angel. I want to notice again, it was just one. That's all it takes. God sent an angel. And that angel stopped the mouths of the lions so that no hurt was done to me, because I'm innocent in your sight. The king knew that. I'm innocent in your sight, O king, and I'm innocent before God. And God has saved me. Oh, the king is happy. He says, pull him up out of there. So Daniel is pulled up out of there. And I told you these men were tyrants. 
The king then turns to his soldiers. He says, go get my governors. Go get those other two presidents and their wives and their children and throw them into the pit. And that's what happened. They brought those governors and their wives and the presidents and their kids and they threw them in. You know what the Bible says? They didn't hit the bottom. Mm -mm. The Bible says those lions jumped up and had mastery of them and they never touched the bottom. They crunched their bones and it was awful as we can well imagine. What a ghastly sight. And then, as if that's not enough, the king said, give me another paper. And I won't read it, but you can read it right there in Daniel chapter 6. The king wrote out another decree. And he said, I want this sent all over the Persian Empire. And here's what it said in essence. He said, let all peoples honor the God of Daniel. Because there's no God like Daniel's God who saved him from the lions. And he is God of heaven and earth. He's the God above all gods. And listen, God, the true God was glorified and honored throughout the whole Persian Empire because an old man, an old man stood up for his convictions. You talk about a light. And I want to emphasize again, Daniel is still a light. Did you know that not only we who are Christians, but of course the Jews also venerate Daniel and the people of Islam venerate Daniel. Daniel, the people of Iran, that's Persia, they honor Daniel. By the way, when Jesus was born, some magi, some wise men from Persia came looking. They saw the star. They came and said, where's the king? We've seen the star. And all Jerusalem was abuzz. King Herod said, what are you talking about? And finally they said, well, the Bible says he'll be born in Bethlehem. How do these wise men, these guys from over there in Persia, know anything about a king being born? They'd read the book of Daniel. That's why Daniel was a magi. He was a wise man, the wisest of them all over there. And so they understood more than a lot of the Jewish people understood. So a light, a light in God's window. Now I want to talk about that for a few more minutes this morning. Daniel was a light. How wonderful. By the way, when I first looked at this chart, I think I need to work these words in, into my sermon. And so I want to work them in just real quickly. Uh, the only person that had peace was Daniel. The king didn't have any peace. He couldn't sleep. I guarantee those other governors, they were up all night thinking we've got rid of him. The lions didn't have any peace. They were hungry pacing back and forth. But Daniel had peace. There was peace down in that den. There was unity. You know who the unity? The unity was? The unity was between an old man, an angel, and the lions. Now you talk about a prayer meeting. There's never been a prayer meeting like this. The lions heard the prayer of Daniel. The angel, of course, heard it. And there was unity down in that den. And of course it was because of his courage that the prophecy of Darius was fulfilled. Darius prophesied God will save you, and he did. And he escaped because of his faith and his hope and the assurance he had in God. So I worked that in. So I got that in for what it is worth. But now I want to talk about the fact that we need to be lights too. And so I want to use this context to talk about the fact that we ought to be lights in three different ways. First of all, this morning, Daniel was a light of honesty. They couldn't find any malfeasance. They couldn't find any dishonesty in his life. And he was a light because of that. Listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 2. He said, I would therefore that prayers and supplications be made for all men, for kings and all that are in authority. Listen, what are we supposed to do when there's a presidential election? Or any other kind of election? Vote? Campaign? Run for office? No, we pray. That's what Paul says. Pray for kings and those that are in authority. God's in control, as Austin prayed earlier. And so we pray that God will overrule the affairs of men. What are we to pray? He said we pray that we, Christians, may live quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and 
honesty. Now that word honesty right there is from a Greek word that means dignity, honor, the highest moral standard. As God's people, we should have a reputation for honesty, for honor. And people should know us as people who are of the highest moral standard. I held a meeting in uh, Kentucky myself several years ago, and the brethren there put me in a motel, and right next door to the motel was a, a Walgreens drugstore. And so one day I walked over there to buy something, I don't remember what, but it wasn't very much. In fact, I gave the clerk a $5 bill, and he gave me back the change. Well, I didn't look at the change. I just took it and stuck it in my pocket. Didn't count it. And I started back to the motel. And so I pulled it out, and I got to counting it, and it was like uh, $7 and some change. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I gave him a $5 bill, and he gave me $7 back. That means he thought I'd given him a $10 bill. So it, you know what I did? I did what you did, what you would do. I turned around, went back, I found him. I said, look, uh, I gave you a five and you, get, you thought I gave you a 10, I guess. And so he got to check in. He said, that's right. He said, oh, thanks for coming back. Not many people do that. He said, that would have really messed me up this evening. Well, you know, I told him I couldn't have slept tonight. I told him I was a preacher, but I was a Christian. And I said, I couldn't have slept tonight if I hadn't come back. Now, I'm sure as I said, you've done that before. Billy will be up here tomorrow night, Lord willing. He says that several years ago he was going somewhere and he wasn't watching the speed limit. He was probably preaching to himself or debating like he does. And so he got over the speed limit and a patrolman pulled him over. And you know, nowadays they want you to stay in the car. But this patrolman came up and said, get out and come back here and sit in my car. So Billy thought, uh-oh. So he went back and got in and the patrolman sat by him. And the patrolman turned to him and said, I want you to tell me why you were speeding. And Billy started answering. The man said, tell me why you were speeding. Billy tried to answer. He wouldn't let him answer. He said, tell me right now why you were speeding. Finally, he let Billy answer. And Billy said, well, I guess I was thinking about something else. My mind was somewhere else. And I just accidentally got over the speed limit. The officer said, you know what? It's a good thing you told me the truth. Because I made up my mind when I pulled you over that if you had lied or tried to make an excuse, I was going to give you a ticket. But because you told the truth, I'm just going to give you a warning and let you go. And of course, Billy was glad that he told the truth. But you know, the point is, the point of these two simple illustrations is we should be known for that. We should be people in this old dishonest world who are known for our dignity and for our honor. Here's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Swear not at all. Now you've heard it was said of old time, if you're going to take an oath, don't swear falsely. Under the Old Testament, if you took an oath, you better keep that oath. But Jesus said, I say to you, don't swear at all. Now I don't believe it's right to swear. In fact, I've been called into court before, or I've had to sign a document before, and it says on there, I swear. And I tell the judge or whoever, I can't swear. Thankfully, thankfully, we live in a country still where we have the right conscientiously to affirm. And most documents will say, I swear or affirm. And so I'll explain if I have to that I can affirm. Why is that? It's what Jesus said. Jesus said, swear not at all. Not by heaven, not by the earth, not by anything. But let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And the point is, we should be people that are known for our honesty. Our word is our bond. If we say yes, we mean yes. If we say no, we mean no. And that should be our reputation. We should be a light for honesty, as was Daniel. But secondly, I want to point out that Daniel was a light of purity. Not only was there no malfeasance in his work, in his government life, but in his personal life. They couldn't find any impurity in his personal life as well. And I love this passage, Ephesians 5 and verse 3. Paul says, but fornication and all unclean, uncleanness, let it not be once named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting. 
I think it's interesting that Paul says these things shouldn't be named once among us as Christians now. We understand we, we stumble, we make mistakes, and God is merciful to forgive us. But the standard, the goal is not one time. Not one time should any of these things be named among us. Now, I like to joke. I like to joke as much as anybody, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Paul here talks about filthy speech. He talks about coarse jesting. And listen, we ought to be known as people that we don't like that. If we're at uh, work on break and somebody's telling a dirty joke, somebody will say, you ought not to say that around Jerry. He doesn't, or maybe we ought to speak up and say, I don't appreciate that. And that should be our reputation. We're a light. We're supposed to be a light. And so that should be our reputation. I like this. This is the New King James translation. Twice it says these things are not fitting. They're not fitting. We just stayed with our grandson Sam and Emma. Emma's 13 now, but when she was about five, they were staying with us. And we were in line at a grocery store. You know how they have those magazines? There was a magazine up there that had a woman uh, almost totally undressed, certainly not dressed appropriately. And little Emma was by me, and she looked up there and said, Peepop, that's not appropriate. Somebody would used the word appropriate with her, and I said, you're right. That's not appropriate. Listen, there are some things that are not fitting. We know how the world dresses. We know what they think is fitting, but not for us. And we should have that reputation. My dad, I want to tell you this, my dad passed away uh, last August, and he was 97. A couple of years before he died, he had to go to a dermatologist to have some minor surgery on his arm. And Daddy said the doctor was sewing up the place, and he said the doctor was there, and there was a couple of female nurses, a couple of women. And so this doctor said, Mr. Dickinson, you're not, I think he was 95 then, you're 95 years old, you've lived a long time, and you've seen a lot of changes. He said, what is the biggest change that you've seen in your life? And I don't know what he thought. He's, he didn't know my dad. Maybe he thought my dad was going to say computers or technology or something like that. My dad said women. It's like that, women. And, of course, the doctor and the two female nurses turned around, Daddy said. And the doctor said, women? What do you mean? Daddy said, I've never seen so many naked women in my life. And after I quit laughing, I said, Daddy, you gave him the right answer. And, of course, what Daddy was saying in his long life, there's been a decay in morals among women and men too. But listen, we're to be a light. We're supposed to be a light in this world. A couple of years ago, I held a meeting in Kentucky. Maybe it's been longer than that. And uh, there was a young man who came forward to make a confession. And I, so I sat by him, and he told me, he said, uh, I think it was last night, this was a Sunday morning, so I guess it was Saturday night, he said, last night, he said, I went to a Leonard Skinner concert. My boss took me to, uh, took all of us employees to a Leonard Skinner concert. And he said, uh, during the concert, my boss started buying drinks for everybody. And he said, I didn't drink, but everybody got drunk, including my boss. And he said, I ended up being the designated driver and had to drive everybody home. And he said, you know what? I just shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have got myself in that situation. So I got up and we had prayer. You know, I went to him. I found him after services. I told him, you know what? I like Leonard Skinner. Sweet Home Alabama. That's one of their songs. And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with going to a concert. But then, you know what? We need to be careful, don't we? We know what goes on at these concerts. And we're supposed to be a light, right? We're supposed to be different, a light to the world. So we got to be careful. We, we want to be a light like Daniel was. A light up here. Lastly, this morning, Daniel was a light of conviction. Conviction. He certainly was. He knew what the law said. He knew exactly what the penalty was, but Daniel was going to do it. And they knew that. They said if we can create a problem with what he believes, and the king will get him. And they got him. They sure did. People all know that about us. They all know we're going to do what's right. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what the problem is. 
and what everybody else does, we're going to obey God and we're going to do what's right, regardless of circumstances, regardless of the problem. Here, this has been a few years ago. We had a uh, man come into our Wednesday night services. And we're a small congregation. And after services, I was talking to him, and he said uh, he was a member of the Church of Christ, but it was a church that used individual cups. And he said, uh, my, I'm looking for a small, conservative, friendly church. I told him, you found it. I said, we're small in number, we're conservative, and we're friendly. And he said, I like this little church. And he said, I'm going to bring my wife Sunday. So he did. He brought his wife Sunday. And I preached and I watched them. They sat through the service and seemed to enjoy it. And then I sat down on the second row. And, of course, I wasn't passing the emblems. But the brother that did said they took the bread. But when the cup came by, they didn't take the cup. And, I mean, they left real fast. They were gone. Well, he didn't sign his name to the registry. I didn't have any idea how to get a hold of him. But he called me a couple of days later. And he said, look, he said, my wife and I really like your little church. Everybody's friendly. Seems like a good group of people. But he said, that cup. He said, you know, there's a lot of germs. And uh, that's not too... He said, could we bring our own cup? And I said, well, no. I said, no. I said, First of all, I told him, you know, silver has antibacterial qualities and grape juice does too. I said, I've got a track I'd like to give to you. You can read about that. But I said, really what it comes down to is, regardless of that, it's a matter of conviction with us. We use one cup because Jesus did and because that's what he told us to do and gave emphasis to that. It's a matter of conviction. Well, he, they never came back. And, of course, there's nothing you can do. But listen, we should be known as people who are convicted. Listen, are you a light? Are you reflecting the light of Jesus in your life today to the world there are people out there who are groping in darkness, and you are, I started to say you may be, but you are the only light that they have that will lead them to the cross. Back in 1871, the famous preacher Dwight Moody was preaching in Chicago, and in his sermon, he referenced a shipwreck that had recently taken place in Cleveland Harbor. There was a ship that was coming in, and it was dark, and it was foggy. And so they couldn't see the shore. Now there was a great big lighthouse which was on top of the hill and it was shining. But the lower lights, which were usually along the shore, were not shining. And so the captain turned to the helmsman and said, where are the lower lights? He said, they've gone out. He said, can we make it? He said, we'll make it or perish. Well, they didn't make it. They crashed on the reef and Many people lost their lives. Now Dwight Moody made an illustration out of that. He said, Jesus is the lighthouse. He's the light. And He's always shining. But we are the lower lights. And we're to be shining down here for Him. Well, there was a man in the audience that day named Philip Bliss, a great songwriter. And he went home. It's amazing to me what these poets can do. And he took that and he wrote the words to the beautiful song that we've sung all of our lives. Brightly beams the Father's mercy from the lighthouse evermore. But to us, he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Dark the night of sin is settled. Loud the angry billows roar. Eager eyes are watching, longing for the lights along the shore. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother. Some poor seaman tempest tossed, trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor struggling, fainting seamen, you may rescue, you may save. Listen, somebody is in the darkness. They're looking for the light. They don't even know what they're looking for. But they're lost and bewildered. You're the light. And you need to lead them to the light. Jesus, is your light shining? If you're not a Christian, you don't have any light. We don't have any light. The only light we have comes when Jesus shines into our lives. So if you're not a Christian, put your faith in Jesus. Be baptized today and let the light of Jesus live in your life. This morning we would be happy to baptize you into Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're here and 
You're a Christian, but your light has grown dim, maybe gone out. Come back. Let the Lord uh, relight the light in your life today. While we stand and while we sing this song, we have selected.